Hello friends, Kerrigan Skelly with the Refuting Calvinism YouTube channel here with you today. And today I want to do a video on probably the most popular, the most popular proof text for the false doctrine of original sin. And that is Psalm 51.5. Uh, there's no verse used more. Uh, when I go to the streets to preach, when I go to college campuses to preach, then Psalm 51.5, when it comes to supposedly proving that original sin, this doctrine, is a biblical doctrine. This idea that we are born sinners. Um, so let's take a look at this, this verse. And I'm going to start out with looking at this verse in several different translations of the Bible. Um... I'll start with the more literal versions, and then I'll move to uh, a more dynamic equivalence translation, or a more phrase-for-phrase -phrase translation found in the NIV. So let's go ahead and read uh, the New King James first, and I'll move on down the line from there. The New King James Version of Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. So we see here in Psalm 51.5, the New King James Version translation, that the manner in which David was brought forth was in iniquity, and the manner in which he was conceived was done in a sinful way. And I want to point out to you, friends, that the, that the, um, the subject here, when it comes to the sin, is not David. Uh, he is involuntary when it comes to this sin being spoken about in Psalm 51.5. Uh, the, the person involved in the sin would be his mother. Once again, it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. So the manner in which he was brought forth was in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. So whose sin is David talking about in verse 5? Is he talking about his own sin or his mother's sin? Well, if you take the literal translation of it, he's talking about his mother's sin. Let's see what the other more literal translations of the Bible have to say about this verse. The King James Version, or the authorized version of Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Not much difference there. It basically says the same exact thing that the New King James Version says. The New King James and the King James are some of the most literal translations of the Bible out there of the Hebrew and Greek. Let's go to the Young's literal translation, which is probably the most literal translation available in our day and age. It says in Psalm 51.5, a Young's literal translation, Lo, in iniquity I have been brought forth, and in sin doth my mother conceive me. Doesn't seem much different than the King James Version or the New King James Version. And once again, the subject of the sin, of the iniquity, is his mother. Not David, but his mother. The English Standard Version of Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Don't see much difference there either. From the English Standard Version, to the Young's Literal, to the King James, or the New King James. Not much difference at all. Let's go to the New American Standard Bible, the NASB, 1995. The, that version of Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Once again, we see in this train of thought of all these translators, all these different groups of translators, all these different versions of the Bible saying the same thing. Now, personally... I only use the King James and New King James, mostly the New King James. Sometimes I'll use the Young's Literal for studying as well, but I usually don't use the NASB and ESV. I don't like the manuscript family it comes from. That's beside the point for this video. I'm just trying to prove to you that just about every more literal translation out there is going to say this very same thing. The subject of the sin in Psalm 51.5 is not even David. It's his mother. Now let's go to the NIV, a more dynamic equivalence translation, a more phrase-for-phrase -phrase translation, not a literal translation. It says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now you see what the NIV translators did there? And of course, NIV has lots of other problems, as I've chronicled in my Sinful Nature Live video. Um, 
and other videos I've done on this issue of original sin, they have other problems too with the Greek word sarx being translated as sinful nature in the New Testament when it really only means flesh. But we see here once again the NIV has another problem. And this is one of the problems, one of the reasons why so many people want to use Psalm 51.5 to supposedly prove that original sin is a biblical doctrine. And one of the reasons that happens so often is because so many people in America read the New International Version of the Bible, which I do not recommend at all. Not just because it comes from a different manuscript family, one that I don't trust, but also because of the way they translate things. The NASB and the ESV, and I believe even the King James and New King James when it comes to the Old Testament, come from the same manuscripts when it comes to the Old Testament. Uh, but even the ESV and the NASB, which comes to the same manuscripts overall, including the New Testament, even they translate Psalm 51.5 the same way the King James and New King James and Young's literal translation translate Psalm 51.5 from the Hebrew. So we see here that um, Psalm 51.5, the NIV translation, is an anomaly. It's not what the Hebrew says, as so many different versions testify to. So if we're going to take the literal translation of Psalm 51.5 from the Hebrew, and we take a literal interpretation of the literal translation, we would say, we don't know the facts of this, we just know what David says in Psalm 51.5. We could say that David's mother was in sin when he was conceived, and was in sin in the way that he was brought forth. And so we don't know the details of that, but I'm going to take David's word on it. Now, if we take the less than literal interpretation of Psalm 51.5, which is warranted, because when it comes to interpreting the Bible properly, one of the first things we must do is determine what kind of literature we're dealing with. The literature we're dealing with in Psalm 51.5, and all of Psalm 51, is poetic literature, which a lot of times is not literal at all. It's very symbolic, very poetic in nature. So we cannot take a literal translation. So if we take a figurative translation of Psalm 51.5, he's probably simply saying, I followed in my mother's footsteps. He's so grieved over his own sin with Bathsheba, which is what Psalm 51 is referring to. This is the psalm that he wrote after Nathan confronted him about his sin with Bathsheba. He's so... Uh, grief, grief stricken over his sin with Bathsheba and Nathan's rebuke from the Lord uh, to him regarding this issue that he's simply saying my mother was sinful I followed in her footsteps that's really all there is to it but to take the Psalm 51.5 version that NIV has doesn't make much sense in light of the rest of the Psalm let's just read the whole of Psalm 51 to get a gist of what it's saying to, to see if there's any other symbolic language involved in it to see what the heart of the issue is regarding Psalm 51, to see what David's trying to communicate to those who would read this psalm uh, in his present, in his day, during when he was alive, and the, the, the ages afterwards. So let's start in, in verse 1. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. That's the version I use the most often. It says, um, uh, at the beginning it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, <clears throat> and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. 
For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. offering. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure design. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then I shall offer bulls on your altar. So I see some symbolic language here. Uh, the first, one of the first signs I see of this, um, and when I say symbolic, I mean less than literal uh, things he's saying here. Uh, for example, uh, he says in uh, verse 4, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Now, is that, is that literally true? Uh, didn't he sin against Bathsheba? Didn't he sin against Uriah? Uh, didn't he sin against the whole nation of, of Israel by doing these things openly and then trying to cover it up? Surely he did. So, I mean, that can't be a literal thing David is saying there because he did sin against people besides God. And then down in verse 7, I see uh, less than literal language again. David says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Now, does hyssop really make him clean? Uh, does hyssop, hyssop really wash him and cleanse him of his sins that he might be white as snow? And we know the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from sins and, and washes us white as snow. But even when I say that, that's a figurative expression. I don't literally have the blood of Jesus uh, come out of a shower head and cleanse me. It's by his shed blood that I can have forgiveness and cleansing of sins. And even back then, before Christ had come into the world, it was the Old Testament sacrifices uh, that would they would offer in order for forgiveness of sins. But hyssop does not literally make him clean or wash him and make him whiter than snow or uh, take away his sins. So he's obviously using figurative language there. We see in verse 8, he says, Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. So did God literally break David's bones? Well, we have no... No recollection of that. We have no uh, historical account of David's bones being broken. He's probably simply saying that he was crushed in his spirit. And if you read the story of that, you see that he lost, they lost him and Bathsheba lost their child because of his sin. Uh, God took his child away. Um, so his bones weren't literally broken, from what I can, can tell. But not, beside that, bones can't rejoice. Bones don't have mouths, they don't have tongues, they don't have vocal cords, they don't have lungs to breathe in and out to be able to sing. Bones have no ability to rejoice and sing. He's simply saying that he will rejoice. So there's lots of figurative language in Psalm 51. So if we're going to take a figurative um, interpretation of this verse, we would come away, in my opinion, of, of David just being so grief-stricken of a sin, they said, I followed in my mother's footsteps, the same way she sinned, I sinned. And we know that earlier in David's life, uh, as he was being anointed king, he was called a man after God's own heart. Now we know, obviously, in this situation with Bathsheba and Uriah, David was not a man after God's own heart in the midst of his sin. Uh, surely you're not going to say that, friends, for those of you who want to use this verse to support your doctrine of original sin. Surely you won't say that. So there's a figurative uh, interpretation that could be warranted here. Um, I think that the more literal interpretation is what we should be taking here, um, that simply his mother sinned, and uh, you know he's maybe he's following her footsteps, maybe he's trying to say that, but if even if we, let's just say for, for a second here, that the NIV, its translation of Psalm 51.5 from the Hebrew into the English, let's say their translation of that is actually accurate. And every other translation, all the little translations we've, we've looked at here today, we've looked at uh, five different ones, let's say all of those are wrong. And the NIV stands alone as being the right translation of Psalm 51.5 from the Hebrew into the English. Well, if that were true, we still would have no problem because, like I said, a less than literal uh, interpretation of this verse is warranted because we see the other verses surrounding it, and because it's a psalm, it's poetic language. And so even if Psalm 51.5 of the NIV is correct, we can still come away and simply say he's using hyperbole. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Maybe he's simply using hyperbole. And hyperbole simply means exaggeration, uh, to prove a point. 
You know, an example of that in the New Testament is Jesus saying to, if your eye calls you sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. Jesus isn't literally saying that he wants you to pluck out your eye or cut off your hand or cut off your foot. He's simply using hyperbole to prove a point that you need to take extreme action to get the sin out of your life. And Psalm 51.5, um, if we take the NIV's translation of the Hebrew to English, he would simply be using hyperbole uh, in saying that I'm so sinful, I've been sinful since the day I was born. That's how gross he feels inside. That's how wicked he feels inside. Um, so that's, we could take that. But if we're going to say that he's trying to promote some doctrine of original sin here, it's utter nonsense with the whole scope of what he's saying in this, this psalm, Psalm 51. He's brokenness. He has contrition over his sin with Bathsheba and against Uriah, you know, telling his military to draw back when Uriah's on the front line so he can get killed. You know, he, he has blood on his hands because of that. Um, so if, uh, if you're going to say this, it doesn't make any sense with the rest of the psalm. If you're trying to say Psalm 51.5, this one verse isolated from the rest of the passage, it's not going to make sense because Psalm 51 is a, is a prayer of repentance. A prayer of uh, it's contrition and brokenness and confession and asking God for forgiveness. And he's repenting over it. He doesn't want to do it anymore. He doesn't want to do it ever again. And so if Psalm 51.5 is some kind of isolated verse where David somehow takes a step back from his prayer of repentance and contrition and brokenness to supposedly uh, give this uh, some kind of verse, some kind of proof text for the doctrine of original sin, it wouldn't make any sense. Now his prayer would become a prayer of excuse. If he's saying, well, you know what, I've, I've been sinful from the day I was born. It's the day my mother conceived me. I've been sinful. And now his prayer in Psalm 51.5 isn't a prayer of repentance, it isn't a prayer of taking accountability and responsibility for his sin, it's a prayer of excuse. Well, God, the reason I did it with Bathsheba and with Uriah was because I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And by the way, did you notice that those two events are two different points in time? Conception happens, and nine months later you're born. So which one is it? If David is literally saying these things, as the NIV translators say he's saying, then he, he either became sinful at conception or sinful at birth. You can't have it both ways. And the question becomes, what happened, if it wasn't conception, what happened at birth? There's some kind of sinful stuff in the woman's cervix, in the woman's birth canal, that's making him sinful as he's coming out and he's born? Uh, what is sinful in the conception? Is there sin in the sperm or is there sin in the egg? And if you're going to say there's sin in the sperm or sin in the egg, what Bible verse can you use to back up such nonsense? The Bible never says such things. But this is where some of the, these theories come for the doctrine of They come from men's imaginations, vain imaginations, where they try to make these things up. But the Bible never says that man's seed is sinful or that woman's egg is sinful. It never says those things. So if Psalm 51.5 is actually saying literally what the NIV translators say it's saying, and we take a literal uh, interpretation of that, then it now becomes a prayer of excuse instead of a prayer of repentance and contrition and brokenness and confession. Now let's just think about the repercussions if the NIV translators are right here, that we are sinful at birth or sinful from conception. Whatever we are, friends, at conception... Whatever we are at birth is what God made us to be. And herein lies the greatest problem, besides it being unbiblical, that I have with this false doctrine of original sin, is it brings accusation upon God's character. You see, whatever you are, friends, in your mother's womb, whatever you are when you come out of the womb, is what God made you to be. It's God's working, it's God's doings when it comes to these things. Let me just read you some scriptures to prove my point, uh, what I'm saying here. We see in Job chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. Remember, I pray, that you have made me like clay. And will you turn me into dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? Clothe me in, with skin and flesh. 
and knit me together with bones and sinews? This is Job saying this in Job 10, 9 through 11. And uh, he's simply saying here that God is the one who clothed him with skin and flesh. Which, where does that happen? It happens in the mother's womb. Uh, he knit him together with bones and sinews. So God's the one who did these things. And Job's saying he did these things. Job 31, 5. Did not he who made me in the womb make them? So, so Job's not even, not even just saying that God made him. He's saying God made these other people as well. Uh, we see in Job 33 and verse 4, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So life, if you're a Christian, starts at conception, and God's the one who gave life. So God's involved in every conception. He's involved in forming the child in the mother's wombs. And when people engage in the act of abortion, this atrocity we see in America, uh, they're destroying God's work, what God is doing. They're stopping him in the middle of his process and destroying his work. And then we see in Psalm 100, which David normally is the writer of the Psalms, Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, he is God, and it is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. So God is the one who's made us, not us. God made us. You may supply the sperm men, you may supply the egg women, but you did not make your child. God makes your child. Psalm 119 and verse 73. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. So we see once again that God is the one responsible for making what we are and fashioning what we are in our mother's womb. Psalm 139 verses 13 through 14 says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. So, we weren't sinfully and wickedly made. We weren't depraved in our conception and in our forming in our mother's womb. We are fearfully and wonderfully made because God is the one who made us. God is our creator. God is the one who uh, cut, forms our inward parts and covers us in our mother's womb. Uh, he's the one who knows our soul very well. Jeremiah 1, in verse 5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew. This is God talking to Jeremiah. Before I formed you, Jeremiah, in the womb, I knew you. So God formed David, God formed Job, God formed, formed the people Job talked about, God formed Jeremiah. Zechariah chapter 12, and verse 1 says, the burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms a spirit of man within him. So the spirit of man is formed within him by God. All men. And so whatever you are, friends, at conception, whatever you are at birth, is God's doings. So if you are a sinner at conception, or you are a sinner at birth, it is God's doing. And so if you're going to hold to this doctrine of original sin, this doctrine of a born sinner or conceived sinner, you have to come to the logical conclusion, since God is the one who makes you, that God made you a sinner. Now, are you willing to say that, friends? Or are you willing to hold to the fact that God is holy, holy, holy? Some of you may even say, well, it's Adam's fault, not God's fault. You know, whatever Adam did in the Garden of Eden, it forces us to be conceived as sinners or born as sinners. Well, first of all, tell me where the Bible says that. The Bible doesn't say that. Look in the account of the fall and see if you can show me where it says that. I have a video I already did on the account of the fall talking about this issue. Um, but secondly, if Adam, if that is true, that what Adam did cause us all to be made sinners, are we born or conceived as sinners, it's still God, God made that rule supposedly, right? It would, wouldn't it be God who made the rule, supposedly, that we, uh, whatever Adam did would make all of us sinners? Isn't that, wouldn't that be God's rule? I mean, God, only, Adam has no power over people who are born hundreds and, and even thousands of years after him to make them sinners. Um, let me just read to you from John Calvin's commentary on Psalm 51.5, just a little excerpt here. 
so you can see what he has to say. This is the Refuting Calvinism YouTube channel. He says, Here the question has been started. How sin is transmitted from the parents to the children. And this question has led to another regarding the transmission of the soul. Many denying that corruption can be derived from the parent to the child, except on the supposition of one soul being begotten of the substance of another. Without entering upon such mysterious discussions, it is enough that we hold that Adam, upon his fall, was the spoiled of his original righteousness, his reason darkened, his will perverted, and that being reduced to the state of corruption, he brought children into the world resembling himself in character. Should any object that generation is confined to bodies, and that souls can never derive anything in common from another, I would reply, that Adam, when he was endued at his creation with the gifts of the Spirit, did not sustain a private character, but represented all of mankind, who may be considered as having been endued with these gifts in his person, and from this view it necessarily follows that when he fell, we all forfeited along with him our original integrity." Now, there's lots of things in there that simply cannot be backed up with Scripture. Where did, first of all, where does the Bible ever say that Adam, when he sinned, uh, that he was despoiled of all original righteousness, that his reason was darkened, his will was perverted, and that being reduced to the state of corruption, he brought children to the world resembling himself in character? Where does the Bible ever say that? Um, and beside the fact that character which has to do with choices, has to do with things you, you act upon, things you do and don't do. A character is not something that can be transferred from one person to the next. Now, it can be learned, but that's, that's nurture. That's not nature. Uh, for example, um, the sins I committed before I became a Christian, my son, who is now nine years old, is not responsible for those sins, and they weren't imputed to him. Um, and it doesn't make his character the same way I was before I became a Christian. Of course, I've been a Christian ever since he was born. Um, and, I'm, and even above and beyond that, just because I'm a Christian does not make him a Christian or any of my other children Christians. Character is non-transferable. You are accountable to God for your sin and your sin alone. Your father and mother are accountable for their sins and their sins alone. Your grandmother and grandfathers and grandmothers and grandfathers are, are accountable for their sins and their sins alone. And so on and so forth, all the way back to Ab and Eve. We're all only accountable for our own sins, not for anyone else's sins. So this whole idea that Calvin uh, supposes here is, uh, is null and void because it's impossible to transfer character and God does not hold people accountable for other people's sins. Uh, he also says that um, um, that in Adam's in Adam we were all re he represented all of mankind, and that when he fell, we all forfeited along with him our original integrity. But where does the Bible say that he re represented all of mankind when it comes to our character or integrity? When it comes to morality, it comes to righteousness or unrighteousness, the Bible never says such a thing. And if you're going to say Romans five or generational curses. I've already done a video on this. I I'd encourage you to go watch that video. But he, he does make a, a kind of like a confession here when he says, without entering upon such mysterious discussions. See, he, he has to say that because he has not one Bible proof text to back up what he's asserting here. This theory of uh, original sin that he's trying to assert here. He says, it is enough that we hold that. Adam, upon his fall, and he gives all the list of things that he says happened when Adam fall. Well, who says we need to hold to that? If the, if I thought sola scriptura was the, was the rule of faith, and rule of doctrine and theology. If that is true, then give me some verses. Give me some Bible verses that back up your theory of original sin. That back up this idea that sin is transferred from one person to the next. I got some scripture from you that refutes that. Let's go to Ezekiel 18. And see what that has to say. Ezekiel 18 and verse 1 says, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. So, this is a proverb going around Israel that says that 
uh, because the fathers have eaten sour grapes, the children get the results, the consequences of that, and their teeth are set on edge. But God says, I live. You shall no longer use this proverb in the house of Israel. So obviously there were some people back then who believed in some kind of form of original sin, some kind of doctrine that, you know, you can be accountable for someone else's sin and vice versa. Let's read on. Behold, this is verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. If a man is just and does what is lawful and right, if he's not eaten on the mountains, nor lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, nor approached a woman during her impurity, if he's not oppressed anyone, but has restored to the debtor his pledge, has robbed no one by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry, and covered the naked with clothing, if he's not exacted usury, nor taken any increase, but has withdrawn his hand from iniquity, and has executed true judgment between man and man, He's walked in my statutes and kept my judgment faithfully. He is just. He shall surely live, says the Lord God. Verse 10. But if he beget a son who is a robber or a shedder of blood, who does any of these things and does none of those duties, which his father did, but has eaten on the mountains or defiled his neighbor's wife, if he has oppressed the poor and needy, robbed by violence, nor not restored the pledge, lifted his eyes to the idols, or committed abomination, if he exacted usury or taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. If he has done any of these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. If, however, he begets the son, this is the, the third generation now, who sees all the sins which his father has done, and considered but does not do likewise, who has not eaten on the mountains, nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, has not oppressed anyone, nor withheld a pledge, nor robbed by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and covered the naked with clothing, who, who has withdrawn his hand from the poor, and not received use or increase, but has executed my judgment and walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, robbed his brother by violence, and did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. Yet you say, here is their belief here. We're about to see this in verse 19, the belief that some people in Israel had. <clears throat> and it's very similar to the, this belief that some people have and that Calvin had when it comes to the doctrine of original sin. That were born sinners or conceived as sinners because of what Adam did long ago. Verse 19, yet you say, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the Son has done what is lawful and right, has kept all my statutes and observed them, he shall sure, surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The Son shall not bear the guilt of the Father, nor the Father bear the guilt of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not they should turn from his ways and live? But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteous which he has done shall not be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed, because of them he shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, it is, not, is it not my way which is fair, and your ways are not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. Again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he has committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves him alive. Because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions which he committed, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, it is not my ways which are fair. Is it not my ways which are fair, and your ways which are not fair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. 
For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore turn and live. So we see here uh, that Israel was saying that God was not fair for several things. One, because the son does not bear the guilt of the father, and the father does not bear the guilt of the son. That's one reason why they said he was not fair. Two, because if someone is righteous and they turn away from it and die in sin, they go to hell. That's another reason they said it was not fair. And three, if someone is living a wicked life and they turn away from that and live righteously, and God lets them live and have eternal life, they say that's not fair. These are all things Calvinism is against. Uh, Calvinism is for once they've always saved. Calvinism is for original sin and for you know us bearing the guilt of our father or being accountable for someone else's sin, someone else's wickedness. When the Bible says very clear in Ezekiel 18 that the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So the wickedness of Adam and Eve is upon them. Not upon me, not upon you, not upon David. And the righteousness of the righteous is upon himself. My son doesn't have my righteousness. You don't have Noah's righteousness. You don't have, if you're a descendant of David, you don't have his righteousness. If you're a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, you don't have their wickedness or their righteousness. You have your righteousness and your wickedness, and you, God will hold you accountable for what you have done, not for what someone else has done. Now, there is a, an issue with nurture here. You can be uh, you know, nurtured in a direction of sin by your parents or by peers or by other people who are influences in your life. But you can also be influenced in the direction of righteousness, too. So, hopefully you see that Psalm 51.5 is not a good proof text for the doctrine of original sin. Hopefully you can see that the more literal translations of the Bible have it right. And they have it right, and we can take a literal interpretation of that, or a figurative interpretation of that verse in Psalm 51.5. Because it's a figurative psalm, there's lots of figurative language, there's also some literal language in it though too. Um, and that the NIV's translation of the Hebrew into English in Psalm 51.5 is wrong. But even if it, were, if it was right, we can take a, a hyperbolic interpretation of that verse, uh, which is a literary technique used to exaggerate a point you're trying to make. And, but even if that is true, even if, the, even if the NIV translators are right and they're translating Psalm 51.5 from the Hebrew into English, we must see this is not a proof text for original sin. Based upon the context, it would become a prayer of excuse instead of a prayer of repentance and contrition and brokenness and confession. And not only that, his subject there is not original sin. Um, it's, it's not what David is talking about. He's talking about his own sin. And lastly, I'll say this. Psalm 51.5 makes no mention of Adam or Eve. It makes no mention of the Garden of Eden. It makes no mention of the fall of mankind. Uh, it makes no mention of everyone everywhere being born sinners or conceived as sinners, as the NIV translators suppose the Hebrew is saying. It's simply talking about David and his mother. Nothing more, nothing less. And... Lastly, as we just talked about from Ezekiel 18, righteousness and wickedness are not transferable. That chapter of the Bible alone debunks the idea that we're born sinners, conceived in sin, uh, with a sinful nature. It debunks it. There's no way. We're not guilty for Adam's sin. You're not guilty for your parents' sin even, who are just one generation back from you. Let alone, you know, hundreds of generations or thousands of generations back with Adam. We're not guilty for their sin. And so, friends, hopefully you can see this. You can see the truth of Psalm 51.5 and what it's really trying to say here and that it's not a good proof text for the doctrine of original sin, mainly because the doctrine of original sin is not a biblical concept or a historical concept when it comes to the early church. Hopefully this video is edifying to you. And um, if you have questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. Look forward to seeing what you have to say and interacting with you on this video. God bless.